welcome back to another edition of Telescope Man. I'm going to do something a little bit different today. I'm going to talk about ARIES, uh, the Amateur uh, Radio Emergency Service. And uh, this is a, a program where amateur radio operators can gather together and uh, run emergency nets and assist uh, cities and counties uh, during any kind of a natural disaster, weather event, or any anything else where they would need some communications uh, capability. So we're going to talk about that today. You know, recently in my area, and I'm going to try not to name names during this, so it may sound a little funny, but I don't want to name names, but. Uh, we recently had a uh, weather event uh, in my area, a quite serious one, uh, with lots of property damage. And uh, I had the opportunity to listen in on uh, several amateur radio nets that were going on at the time. Couldn't monitor all, all of them that were going on, but uh, I do want to mention some things that... Uh, uh, if there's any city officials watching this video, I hope you take some of these things I'm going to say to heart. Because one day, uh, you may need to know some of these things or prepare, more importantly, to prepare in advance uh, for some kind of event that may be beyond the scope of uh, your city to handle. So anyway, this is kind of the tale of two cities, and let's start this by saying that uh, both cities had what's called an EOC, an Emergency Operations Center. However, in one city, I must say it's kind of a hard-to-get-to location. Um, <clears throat> Let's even call it secret a little bit. It's like secret. You really don't know uh, the operations of that center or who mans it or what they do exactly or what's going on or nothing. You know, virtually no information coming out to the general public. Meanwhile, uh, at the other city, a uh, very well-known EOC, very nice EOC, uh, really set up uh, kind of perfectly for, there goes my radio, really set up kind of perfectly for uh, an emergency event of any type. It's a very nice building, uh, readily accessible. Uh, you can actually just come in and walk into the ELC when it's not in operation and look around. Uh, it's got nice conference uh, facility, big table, radios, uh, internet access, backup power, uh, TVs, uh, of course phones and things like that. Uh, quite nicely set up and it is actually set up inside the uh, main fire station. Uh, Part of the building is the fire station itself, and the other part is the EOC. And they've already made plans that, you know, the city officials would gather in that spot and be able to answer public questions or questions that the public may have and uh, media may have. And, you know, you'd have the fire chief there and the police chief and probably the mayor and some other city officials uh, in that room coordinating the event along with amateur radio operators uh, because they're fully outfitted there for radio communications. They even have an HF uh, station set up inside that EOC, along with VHF and UHF stations. Uh, they do drill all the time uh, with the amateur radio uh, local operators there uh, that come in and practice with the city uh, during a drill. You know, most
most recently we had a drill where it was a supposed commercial airplane crash with multiple uh, uh, <coughs> deaths and people running to the hospital and things like that and that was all tracked from this facility. So they use it uh, several times a year during drills so I have no doubt that the tale of these two cities, the one, the one with the open EOC that manages events, uh, would probably be better uh, during that actual emergency than the other city that has kind of a closed secret operation. So uh, let me kind of read you uh, what I call my list of it's not my fault if you do this. It's not my fault. Okay, so I've got a little list of 8 or 10 or 12 things that I'm hopeful if you're a city official you'll take these to heart. Uh, I have noticed during some of these drills uh, while I'm sitting there maybe operating a radio or something and I can see everybody in the room that there'll always be a certain number of city officials including FEMA officials and other emergency personnel on their cell phones. They are talking on their cell phones and I watch them text message on the cell phones and <laughs> and do all that kind of thing while we're on the radio actually talking directly to uh, other people in the field that are giving us information which we're logging. So uh, you know during a real emergency those cell phones will not work. So if you, you're a city official and you're in a drill and you see people using cell phones, I would encourage you to go around the room and gather up all those cell phones and then look them in the eye and say, now let's see if you can do it without this. Uh, they won't have them. There's a wide power outage or... Uh, you know, especially in California or somewhere like that where there might be an earthquake. You know, the power is <laughs> going to go off, the cell towers are going to go off, the internet's going to go off, and uh, if the only thing they know to do is pick up their cell phone, they're going to be in big trouble. So pay attention during a drill and see who's using these cell phones and put a stop to that. The other thing I noticed was there's no, doesn't seem to be any central repository of event uh, accumulated knowledge, let's just call it that. You know, data, the data traffic that might be coming across, the voice the traffic, any messages that were relayed, things like the number of fatalities or where is the power outage exactly. Uh, you know, is it confined to a certain area or is it widespread? Uh, doesn't seem to be in anywhere I've looked at a kind of a, what would you call it, a, uh, well, in, in uh, emergency services you'd call it a public relations director or a media director or something like that. Someone that knows everything that's going on because they're being fed information uh, continuously, probably in an EOC location, and then when they get a question, they that question goes to that person and they know the answer to that question. I saw this firsthand during a drill, during this drill I talk about, about the plane crash. Uh, we already knew how many fatalities there were. We knew how many were going to the hospital and what condition they were in. Uh, you know, rather rather uh, uh, deceased or uh, seriously injured or just minor injuries. We knew that. And at the time of the drill, the public relations person who was never in the room uh, while all this was going on was called in and the media wanted to know about the drill and what was going on and that person 
never asked anyone um, any facts or anything before she uh, answered the question. Just simply said, I don't know. And I kind of smiled at my desk and basically we knew, but that person didn't know. So uh, doesn't, that, that public point of contact seems to be uh, no one's in charge. No one appoints anybody to do that and to have all the notes and everything that's going on and to be listening continually and taking notes and be able to answer the general public or the media. That doesn't seem to be happening. Now I did notice on the other hand that virtually any city nowadays that you look up on the internet, they have a fantastic website. I'm telling you, you get all the phone numbers and email addresses and departments and everything, but during an emergency, none of that is going to work. None of those phone numbers are going to work. That email isn't going to go through. They're not going to be listening to it anyway or looking, looking at their email, more than likely, if it's a serious emergency. So all those websites are only good day-to-day uh, -day activities. You know, where do I get a driver's license or something like that. They are totally useless. Well, let's don't say totally. Let's just say 90% useless uh, during an actual emergency. So, uh, you know, if they tell you, well, we have all this stuff for the public on a website, well, that's not good enough. That won't work. The other thing I've noticed is it's highly dependent on the community that you happen to be living in, the relationship between the local amateur radio operators and the city or county. It's totally uh, based on where you are. Some places very, very good. In fact, this one city that I won't name, it's very, very good. Whereas, in the other city, I kind of get the feeling that they think we're a pain in the behind and they really don't want to have anything to do with the amateur radio operators. Uh, I would say even to the, almost to the extent of disdain for amateur radio operators. <coughs> now, I'm going to mention something about that in a little while, but I think you'll find that it's just totally dependent on where you happen to be living. So I would, if you're listening to this, I would start questioning your city officials and saying, uh, do you know uh, who, who are the local amateur radio clubs in this area? Just in case we have an emergency where nothing works, we can get in touch with them. Uh, has that even crossed your mind? You know, that kind of thing. <clears throat> uh, as far as EOC goes, uh, I, the only question I would say you need to ask your city officials is, do we have an EOC? That I can go see, you know, uh, during normal business hours to see what it looks like. Yeah, it's possible for me to do that. And is that EOC 100% capable of being off the grid? And that's a yes or no question. That is not a long drawn out. It's either yes, we can operate with no power, nothing. We, we can stay running for X number of hours uh, or days. Uh, you know, with nothing, or the other answer is, well, no, it is connected to the grid in this fashion or that fashion. But I would, uh, I would uh, uh, tell them that you want an EOC that's a hundred percent off the grid and could stay off the grid indefinitely with, you know, a few resources: food, water. <laughs> Uh, uh, diesel for the generator or 
solar cells, uh, assuming we didn't have clouds, you know, recharging or something. Something like that. And it needs to be in a location that's accessible to the public. Now, I don't mean for the public to go inside the EOC during operations, but it needs to be in a place that's easy, easily accessible, and that would be the most proper place, probably, to do your communications to the media and to the general public out of that place or in front of that place or out in the hall in that place or however it might be arranged. <clears throat> and of course this flows into my earlier comment about uh, no public information coordinator that knows what's going on uh, to communi communicate to the, to the general public. That's real important. I get a kick out of uh, another thing, another point, is emergency trailers. Now, by that I mean a communications type trailer. Uh, you know, God forbid the dispatcher's office is taken out and cannot be used and, and there's no dispatch going on. Do you have a backup trailer? that could uh, be used as a dispatch location, yes or no. Well, most of the time, especially if it's a more well-to-do city, the answer is going to be yes. But the next question you should ask is, do people know how to get into it, turn on all the radios, and work the equipment just like they did when they were back at the regular dispatch office. And uh, is everything in the trailer operational? You know, if they're not taking this trailer out several times a year and testing everything, you know, I'd be highly suspicious. If they're not training multiple people to operate the trailer, I would be highly suspicious. And I don't care if they spent a hundred thousand dollars on the trailer and it's got every it's got a satellite dish on it. If no one knows or how to operate it or only one or two people know how to operate it, you're gonna be in big trouble if a real emergency happens. So uh, multiple people need to know how to operate. And it's gotta be tested. <clears throat> The other thing I, I find real curious, and uh, I'm going to point my finger at FEMA uh, about this one, is they have lots of emergency equipment. You name it, they probably have it. However, what they usually do is they store this equipment in one location, or maybe two locations. You know, so you'll have a, a little warehouse and it's got all the generators in it and all the tents and everything else they can get in there. And the only thing I say about that is there needs to be some uh, thought given to what if that building is taken out as part of the uh, uh, weather event? What if they... What if that uh, F4 goes right through that building and now you have no equipment or half of your equipment is gone? Now what? You know, or maybe you had all the uh, tents in that building and now all the tents are gone. You know, this is something you need to consider. It needs to be scattered out about the city in different locations uh, to make it less susceptible to uh, some earthquake, weather event, or anything else that might impact one location. Uh, also, uh, who has access to the, all this equipment that the taxpayers have already paid for? Is it two people over at FEMA? Is there anyone in the city that can get in this warehouse and get stuff out without writing up 15 notes and uh, sending it to the White House to get stuff out of the, out of the uh, emergency warehouse? 
uh, there needs to be a plan there with multiple people that have permission to uh, get that stuff out once, uh, you know, it's been de declared a uh, disaster area. Not just one person with the key or two people with, with the key. It needs to be some people in the city government that have that authority. <coughs> And uh, another point would be that whatever you have in this warehouse, it needs to be pulled out and tested twice a year. Uh, you just can't leave stuff in there and hope that the day comes when you need it that it's all going to work. So if it's been in a warehouse for four years and no one uh, has looked at it other than to take inventory, and to confirm that it's all there, well, uh, I would start asking questions about when you're going to pull this stuff out of here, test it, and then put it back in here. And that needs to be done a couple of times a year, especially in the case of a, a generator. Uh, you know, that's going to be a critical piece of equipment. And if you haven't tested a generator and at least on an annual basis, I mean, you really can't be sure that it's going to start and work or whatever. Another one I have seen before is uh, the equipment that might be put aside for emergency purposes that's not used every day. It's just extra equipment. Uh, this equipment just sits there for long periods of time. Uh, might be somebody taking inventory, might not, and the day's going to come when you're going to have to pull out these radios or whatever they are that you have in backup, and uh, I'm, I'd just be curious if they're yeah. even programmed with the right frequencies. Frequencies can change, uh, talk around groups can change. Uh, you know, things like that. The uh, trunking uh, system might change. And when was the last time that somebody checked all this equipment that you have in backup that uh, uh, might not be very worth very much during an emergency? <clears throat> uh, I guess my main point in this is I have seen some cities that have. Uh, no determination or knowledge, let's just call it knowledge of local amateur radio operators. They don't even think about them until everything fails. And then all of a sudden, they're jumping up and down trying to get the amateur radio operators to set up all their equipment remotely, portably, and start shadowing people and doing things like that, but they usually wait until everything else has failed. Well, why don't you do this during normal drills? Why don't you get them involved with you in normal drills? Shadowing people, uh, city officials, uh, operating a station that's logging everything coming in, you know, things like that. Uh, where they're kind of integrated already into your emergency operation. So, you know, <clears throat> the saying is uh, uh, amateur radio works uh, when all else fails, and that's usually the time we get the call is when everything fails. All of a sudden, they're our buddy. You know, up until then, they didn't want to have anything to do with us. But when everything fails, all of a sudden, they're our buddy. So try to find out who your buddy is before everything fails. The other thing is relying on, uh, I hear this all the time, well, we got all these state resources and federal resources that we can call on and we can get anything in the world, I mean, that you could think of. Yeah, you can. Uh, a couple of days after the event happens or maybe several weeks after the event happens, uh, especially if it's a large asset, you know, like housing or something like that. Uh, you know, it might take weeks to get there. 
Uh, certainly, even FEMA says that the public should be uh, able to survive uh, two to three days on their own uh, so that they have an opportunity to uh, get supplies to that area. So this statement about we, can, we don't need anybody, we have all these other resources, well that doesn't count for much during the first few days, especially if everything fails. The other thing that I see going on is there's no chain of command within the city. Yeah, I know we have a mayor. I know we have a mayor, so I suppose the mayor's in charge. But is there a backup for the mayor? What if the house fell on the mayor? Are the mayors cut off from the city uh, or the place where the emergency happened? Can't get there. What about the fire chief and the police chief? Do they have backups? Is all of this written down or is it just in somebody's head? You know, is there a chain of command written out and everybody knows who's in charge? Uh, one, two, three, four. You know, I'd have at least two or three backups for everybody. Uh, now, FEMA has guidelines on this. Uh, but have you tested them? Has your particular community tested these guidelines? Uh, you know, you may even have an EOC set up and you might do a drill where the mayor shows up and some city officials and uh, the police chief, the fire chief, and so forth. Now, what if some of those people don't show up? Who takes their place? That's my question. And I doubt, I'm, I'm going to just say it, I doubt very seriously that they have a really good plan with backup people that will go into the EOC in lieu of the normal ones that you would think would show up. So that would be another thing. Again, remember all the fancy websites and your cell phones, uh, you know, all that stuff is going to be offline and you will not be able to use it. So when you drill, be sure you drill without any of that going on. And you probably ought to drill without any power. I wonder if you could do a drill and coordinate everybody without any power supply. You need to think through that. So with that said, I just leave you as I usually do with uh, clear skies and 73. And everybody have a great day. And we'll see y'all later. And remember, keep looking up to see the greatest show on earth right over your head. Everybody.